So maybe your orthodontist told you that you need jaw surgery to correct your bite, or maybe you're just here to learn more about orthodontics. Well, regardless, in today's video, we're gonna talk about different types of procedures that can be done to the lower jaw to correct an overbite, which is more correctly termed as an overjet. We're gonna talk about when this treatment is done, why it's indicated, the complication, the age range, if you're a candidate, what to expect. We're gonna cover all of that and any other questions you might have on today's episode of Braces Explained. Let's go. What's up guys, Dr. Greg here back with another episode of Braces Explained. I hope you guys have all been doing awesome. Today what I wanna talk about is the different types of surgical options to correct an overbite. But before we get started, I'm gonna briefly go over this because we talked about it in just the last video. But an overbite is how much your upper and lower teeth overlap each other in the vertical dimension, okay? What we're gonna talk about today is overjet, which is the more proper term, meaning your upper teeth are further forward compared to your lower teeth. This is also called a class two bite. So this is actually a really, really difficult video for me to make because I feel as though it's such a complicated topic, but I really wanted to do my best to kind of simplify it down to the bare bones while giving it you know, all the respect it deserves because it is a complicated topic, but I do wanna share with you guys because I know a lot of you guys are very, very curious about this whole process. Jaw surgery is indicated with orthodontics whenever your upper or lower jaw are either too far forward or too far backward in relationship to one another. I'm gonna be talking about upper jaw surgery in another video where I'm talking about for underbites, for gummy smiles and things like that. But in today's episode, I wanna introduce the topic of jaw surgery with the lower jaw, which is a little bit more simple to understand. So a class two bite can be caused by a number of different things. It can be that your upper jaw is too far forward, your upper teeth are too far forward, your lower jaw is too far back, your lower teeth are too far back, or a combination of two or more of these things. In today's video, I wanna focus on the last one. So basically a class two bite that's caused by the lower jaw being too far back. This is called an underdeveloped mandible, a receding mandible, a retronathic mandible. There's a bunch of different ways to say it, but it's basically meaning that your lower jaw is underdeveloped. If you're loving this video so far, please be sure to give that thumbs up button some love and don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. All right, let's get back into it. And we've seen that these class two bites can be fixed in a number of ways. If it's a very minor class two bite, rubber bands can be used to bring the upper teeth back and the lower teeth forward. If it's a little bit more severe, something like a forces or extractions can be used to make it so those upper and lower teeth fit together. But you have to remember, orthodontists can only move teeth within the bones. So if the upper jaw is too far away from the lower jaw or vice versa, your orthodontist can straighten the teeth out within their individual arches but we can't push the teeth out of the bone because that would be one, unstable, two, terrible for your teeth, three, bad for the long-term prognosis, and overall is just not a good thing and it's not what we are trained as orthodontists to do. So this leaves us with only one option, to correct where the bones are in relationship to one another so that you can have a stable, aesthetic, and functional bite as well as a nice profile. So first let's talk about what's jaw surgery. Well, jaw surgery is basically a procedure that's done by an oral surgeon that works with an orthodontist to correct the positions of your jaw. This could either be the upper jaw, the lower jaw, or a combination of both sometimes. So a lot of the times with these class two bites, what your body tries to do is it tries to compensate. Your body wants your upper and lower teeth to meet with one another. So a lot of the times when you have an underdeveloped lower jaw, what happens is your upper teeth lean backwards and your lower teeth lean forward to attempt to have a appropriate bite but your profile still looks very class two, meaning that your lower jaw appears to be underdeveloped. This is why orthodontics is necessary before jaw surgery in order to put the teeth in the right spot within the bones and do what we call decompensate, because we're trying to get the teeth out of their compensated zone. We wanna get them into their stable zone so that once we move the jaws, the teeth are situated in a healthy position within the bones. So if you have a class two bite, you can imagine that this makes the bite actually worse what we're gonna be doing is bringing the lower teeth backwards so that they're upright over the bone and the upper teeth forwards so that they're upright in the bone so that when we actually do our jaw surgery, the teeth are in the right spot within the individual bones and the upper and lower jaws are in the correct position with relation to one another. Does that make sense? So I kind of touched on this a little bit, but orthodontic surgery or jaw surgery is rarely done without orthodontics. This is because the orthodontist is needed as part of the team in order to set up the teeth in the proper position so that when the surgery is done, the teeth can fit together. Because if you just did the surgery without an orthodontist, when the jaws are moved, the teeth are not gonna fit properly with one another and you're gonna have a very uncomfortable and unstable bite. 
so an orthodontist is needed during this whole process. Jaw surgery cases usually run anywhere between 18 to 24 months, some being shorter and some being longer. And this is like a huge rough estimate because if you can imagine everyone's case is incredibly different. So I don't even know why I'm recommending a number, but roughly that's where they land. And the jaw surgery, I usually say is about at the two thirds mark, okay? So your orthodontist does a lot of this decompensating work to line up the teeth and getting them in the proper position within the bones and then you have the jaw surgery, and after the jaw surgery, your orthodontist works to finalize the bite, getting the teeth to fit in their new ideal position within the new position of the jaws, as well as correcting any relapse that might've happened during the surgery. Because if you can imagine during the healing process, the bones move ever so slightly, and that throws off the bite. So we have to work to make it so that the teeth, jaws, and bite are all in a stable position. So this brings up the question, who is the right age for this? What is the right candidate for jaw surgery? Well, you wanna make sure that you're not growing when jaw surgery is being performed because if you're still growing and the jaw surgery is done, then it's gonna to totally throw off everything. In females, the lower jaw continues to grow throughout the teens and in males, it actually goes into the early 20s. So your orthodontist will let you know when you're a good candidate for this treatment because they take x-rays periodically and they'll overlay them. And if the x-rays are showing that your lower jaw is still growing, then we might want to wait until you're done growing to begin with the jaw surgery. But once you're done growing, there really isn't an age that's too old to have the jaw surgery done, but you must be a healthy candidate for the surgery because if you can imagine, it is a pretty invasive procedure. We are fracturing and moving the jaw bones and resulting in a pretty big bony healing process. So you need to be a healthy person to have the surgery done and you also have to be non-growing. So let's go a little bit into the timeline of how this will get done. So the first thing that would happen in this process is that you would work with your orthodontist to come up with a plan as well as find an oral surgeon that you will be working with throughout this process. Typically the beginning of this journey, your bite is actually gonna be getting worse. And I know that's counterintuitive, but we talked about it a little bit. We're gonna be having to decompensate what your body has done to achieve that bite. Now, if you're a class two patient and your upper jaw is in a good position, but your lower jaw is further back, what we have to do is bring those lower teeth back and the upper teeth forward. Now this can be done in a number of ways. If your lower teeth are really far forward, sometimes your orthodontist might extract some teeth on the bottom to bring those lower teeth upright over the bone so that when we do surgery, we can move the jaw forward. Also in other cases, we might actually use class three elastics. And if you guys don't remember what class three elastics is, I talked about it in another video, but it's basically the way we wear rubber bands if you had an underbite. And I know you're like, wait a minute, that's the wrong direction. And that's exactly what it is. It's basically bringing your upper teeth forward and your lower teeth backwards, making your overjet worse. But then with the surgery, we can bring those lower jaw and teeth forward so that you have an ideal angulation of these teeth and an ideal bone position. So once your orthodontist decides that you are ready to go to surgery, then you'll go to the jaw surgery. And the jaw surgery is done with an oral surgeon, usually in a hospital setting. The surgery has pretty small incisions. It's nothing too big. It's all done intraorally, but the surgery takes about two to four hours to complete. Okay, and this is done through general anesthesia, like I said, in a hospital setting. A lot of the times the oral surgeon will like you to spend the night, but you usually don't spend more than one day there. It's like one day under observation, then you can go home and you usually are gonna be out of work for about a week or two. And throughout all this time after the surgery, you're gonna be on a liquid diet for about six weeks. Now everyone's case is a little bit different. I'm not gonna be the one that's really giving these recommendations or anything like that because I'm not an oral surgeon. If you guys would like me to bring an oral surgeon onto the channel, please let me know in the comments of today's video. I think it'd be a kind of a cool interview, but I don't wanna steer too far off of orthodontics. But if you guys wanna know more about it, I'm more than happy to bring on one of my friends and we could talk about that. But then after your oral surgeon is done with the surgery and the healing process has already begun, they'll give you the thumbs up to go back and see your orthodontist and they'll do the final changes to your bite and the alignment to make it so that your case is complete and finalized. So next, let's talk about some complications that may arise if you have a lower jaw surgery. Well, the first and most common probably that you might have what's called lip paresthesia, which means that you're not gonna have any feeling of your lower lip and this may or may not return. This is because there's a nerve that travels inside the lower jaw and it's called the inferior alveolar nerve, the IAN. And whenever this nerve is disrupted through a surgery or anything like that, it could be irritated and actually cause lack of sensation of the lower lip area. Like I said, some of the times this comes back, but sometimes it doesn't. So that's one of the biggest complications and long lasting effects of this jaw surgery. Other things that can occur is you can have infection like you can with any surgical procedure. You can have limited range of opening, especially in the early parts of your treatment if you don't have any physical therapy. And you can also have some joint issues. 
Now, I said earlier, this could help joint issues, but it could also sometimes aggravate the joints because now your body has to get used to a new position for your bite and your jaw, so that might irritate the temporal mandibular joint. But these are all things and great questions to bring up with your oral surgeon and orthodontist when you're coming up with a plan for your case. Sometimes if the overbite is so severe and you're both your upper and lower jaws are too far back, they might actually recommend you have both jaws have surgery. So you'd have the lower jaw come forward and the upper jaw come forward with it. So in a case of this, it's called bimax retronathia, which means that both of your jaws are too far back. But when you have these two jaw surgeries, it's actually called bi jaw surgery. And I know a lot of you guys on this channel have had bi jaw surgery, so I kind of want to talk about it here, but we'll talk about that in a different video, so don't worry too much about that right now. So I hope it did a good job explaining this to you guys and kind of how jaw surgery works when it's indicated. I will be doing another video on upper jaw surgery and kind of the complications and the process with that. But I felt like this would be a good introduction because the lower jaw is a lot more simpler to understand. It either moves forward or backwards. Whereas with the upper jaw, you can expand, you can rotate, but we'll talk about that in another video. If you guys wanna learn more about this or if you know someone that's had jaw surgery, let me know in the comments of today's video. And while you're down there, be sure to give it a thumbs up and hit the subscribe button so you can stay up to date with more content like this. That's all I have for you guys today. Be sure to stay healthy, happy, and keep smiling. I will catch you guys next time on Braces Explained, but for now, Dr. Greg out.